Genealogy is all the rage. There are plenty of websites and search companies to help. Some search birth and death, migration and marriage, council and electoral records for you. Others even investigate your DNA. People construct family trees, join historical societies, organise big reunions. Europeans look for the blood of aristocrats or great historic figures in their veins. Whereas Australians hope to find a convict or bushranger in the family line. The first words of the New Testament are in fact the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. And thereafter follows a long list of Jesus' ancestors, often recited at the Christmas Masses before midnight. St Matthew sought thereby to highlight that the baby born of Mary was indeed of the Holy Spirit, but was also a real human being with an extended family, history and culture. His account picks and chooses a bit as it traces 14 generations of ancestors between Abraham and David when they became the royal family of Israel. 14 more generations until the exile when they lost their position and another 14 generations until kingship was definitively restored in Jesus Christ. Jesus is presented then as the cause and site for the reign of God. Make him yours. Make yourself his as God king, God's kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. And so we meet the greats of Jewish history in Jesus' family line. Abraham, our father in faith, the patriarchs Isaac and Jacob, the illustrious King David, Solomon the wise and Josiah the pious, the honourable Joseph and the faithful Mary. Jesus is presented as the culmination of all that is best in our history. The patriarchs, prophets, priests, potentates and parents. It seems, on the face of it, a rather European style of family tree, full of the great and the good. Yet beneath the surface is a rather more Aussie-looking family gum tree. Like most families, Jesus' tree is full of non-entities. And those whose names mean anything to us are a very mixed bunch indeed. At the top of the tree are, of course, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, later known as Israel. But Jacob, we know, conspired with his mother to trick his father and thus steal his place in the line from his brother Esau. He was then conned in turn, taking the wrong girl for wife and so fathering Judah. Judah was also tricked, in his case by his own daughter-in-law, Tamar, having lost several husbands, most recently the infamous Onan, she played the harlot, lured Judah to her bed, and so conceived Perez, her son and brother-in-law, in one. 
Hearing his daughter-in-law was a pregnant lush, Judah ordered her execution, only then to learn that he was the father. So there's a lot packed into an innocent-sounding line, like Isaac was the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, Tamar being their mother. Drop a few lines down in the family tree, and we're told Salmon was the father of Boaz, Rahab being his mother. Boaz was the father of Obed, Ruth being his mother. Again, it sounds ordinary enough, until we realise that Grandma Rahab was another notorious prostitute who betrayed her own people to massacre. And as for Ruth, so determined was she to carry on the line that she slipped into Boaz's bed, though she was not his wife. But because the baby Obed was to be King David's grandfather, all was forgiven as the family tree wound its serpentine way towards Jesus. It seems that God can indeed write straight with crooked lines, working not just through the great and the good, but also despite and even through the not so good. As the final report of the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse revealed to the Catholic Church the shocking deeds of some of its clergy, religious and lay church workers and the inaction of some church leaders. We ache with shame and sorrow for the young people who were so terribly hurt. We rededicate ourselves to bringing such justice and healing to them as we can. And we resolve to do all in our power to ensure this is never repeated. But we are confronted yet again with the fact that there have been more than a few rotten apples in our church's history, all the way back to Jesus and before, and more than a few failures of leadership. Ours is a family that needs periodic and radical renewal, a family that needs Christmas. So much for part one. Part two of the genealogy turns out to be equally seedy. David is Jesus' most famous ancestor. A shepherd boy become king, poet, musician, slayer of giants, all round great guy. But scratch the surface and you find a ruthless bandit who through various intrigues and murders secured power for his family. A voyeur, he had an affair with a married woman, murdered her husband, took her for his wife, and sired Solomon by her. Unsurprisingly then, Solomon was no great example of family values. He took 700 princesses as his wives and had 300 commoners on the side as his concubines. Well, no wonder he had so many descendants. But next in the line that stretches to Jesus is Rehoboam, a reprobate who introduced pagan rites and male prostitution into the temple. The royal descendants continued thereafter as a most unseemly crew. Idolaters, assassins, a mass murderer or two, 
and a wizard who engaged in child sacrifice, as well as more mundane examples of lust and ambition, greed and mismanagement. As our culture is riven by debates over life and love, and our politics all too often descends into fiasco, we might recall that God's plan has often been worked out, not just by the peace-loving and pure-hearted, but in polities and cultures muddled about values and led by the ruthless and irreligious. And so the line of Jesus carries forward until we come at last to the sentimental story of Christmas with angels, shepherds and kings, with fields, animals and manger, with mother, father and baby. Yet even that romance is far from tidy. The mother is dogged with suspicion and snub. The angels sing of joy and peace, even as Herod sets about killing the little children. The kings of the earth shower gifts on the babe, yet the family find no welcome at the inn and must flee to Egypt to safety. Their story echoes through the ages to our time, in which asylum seekers, including desperate young men, pregnant women and newborn babies, still risk all in search of a safe inn. It resonates in the emotional complexities of Christmas for many, where families are hurting or bored where someone is missed or would like to be. It resounds in our time in the terrorist killings of children this year in Manchester, Mogadishu and Manhattan, leaving populations grieving and terrified as in Bethlehem of old. And it echoes still in Bethlehem today where high concrete security walls and checkpoints confront residents and pilgrims alike. When I was there recently, I saw a painting on that wall of a white peace dove wearing a flak jacket and jailhouse graffiti saying, make hummus, not walls. The Christmas story, then, has everything. All human life is there, gathered around the cradle of a child. Light and dark, joys and heartbreaks, hopes and fears, angels and devils. And so the patriarchs are there beside the three kings the nobodies and worse with the shepherds, all attending this vigil in search of hope, goodwill, peace. If you are ever disappointed with your own family, your country or your church, that some lack faith or don't practice what they preach, or if there's mental illness, addiction or abuse, feuding, promiscuity or poor communication, if there's financial stress or work stress, cooling passion or too much passion, whatever it is, rather than imagining you and yours are uniquely cursed. Remember, it was all there and worse in Jesus' own family tree. Rather than the perfect,
Jesus came to join a family just like yours. Indeed, yours is the very family he connects with this Christmas. But Jesus joins you this Christmas, not to say that sin and sadness are all there is, that human beings are doomed to be mired in such things, and that the best he can offer is to stand beside you. No, God made baby says that by grace things can be better. Humanly, humanity can be united to divinity and transformed by it. A new page is turned tonight for you, for us all. A new start given. The genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham, continues. For of him was born the church, and onto that family are grafted all the baptised, and our hopes for every person. <laughs>